You know, Mr. Speaker, last Thursday, Canada's ambassador to the U.S. made the following statement on CBC's power and politics regarding the potential shutdown of Enbridge's Line 5. I quote, It is not a threat to Canada's national economic or energy security. I think that it is an important dispute or disagreement that exists between Enbridge and the state of Michigan and needs to be taken very seriously. Now, the minister says something totally different. This is a bit of a pivot for this government, whose Minister of Natural Resources stated at the committee back on March 4th that Line 5 is a critical energy and economic link that is vital to Canada's energy security and that the government takes the threat to our energy security very seriously. Mr. Speaker, this is last week. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about this government supposedly understanding the consequences of Line 5 being shutting down. Yet our ambassador, when you ask her the question, she doesn't see the same urgency necessarily as we see it here in Canada, or as the minister claims to be saying it is here in Canada. Why the disconnect? If we had a true uh, actual plan in place to deal with Line 5 and the shutdown of Line 5, there would be no missteps, there'd be no misquotes, there would be no uh, misspeaking. There would be a consistent message coming not only from the minister, from the prime minister, but from our, our ambassador and everybody who's talking to people down in the U.S. in regards to Line 5. But there isn't. So one has to say, how seriously has this government taken Line 5 shutdown to be? Now, you could say, well, and the member from Kingston will say this, that, well, well, why aren't you bringing forward suggestions and proposals? Okay, let me bring in some proposals. May 12th, line shuts down. How many trains have you acquired? How many rail cars have you acquired? How many trucks have you booked? Now, just on the trains, I think you're going to need something like 8,000 rail cars a day. Pardon me, 800 rail cars a day. So that's roughly 200 cars to a train. So that's a train every six hours. And on top of what's already heading down those lines as we speak today. Now, I'm a farmer here in Saskatchewan, and we have all sorts of fun and rail issues in the wintertime when it comes to getting trains delivering product to port on time. Have you put in a plan for dealing with that? When you look at trucks, if you're going to go to 25,000 trucks today, have you talked to the Windsor Border Authority and said, okay, how are we going to handle that volume of trucks going across the border? How many people have you hired to deal with the movement of those trucks across the border? What have you done with the, the mayor of Windsor and the mayor of Detroit in regards to facilitating this type of movement through their cities? Hmm. Bet you they haven't thought about that. You know, it, it's really interesting. This, this government doesn't do anything until it's a crisis. Now, there was talk about this during the campaign last fall with the um, the governor, and she had this proposal, and she's an extreme leftist, an extreme environmentalist, and she doesn't care if she shuts everything down and people get laid out, thrown out of work. That doesn't care, but she, she wants to go to her environmental buddies and check a box. Well, if they're really serious about the environment, if they're really concerned about it, and they really had an issue about it, why wouldn't they put in a reasonable plan? If they said to us, okay, we need to do something different in the Straits. Oh, wait a minute. Enbridge already has a reasonable plan. They already have a game plan where they're actually going to borrow underneath the Straits and then put the pipe in concrete, in concrete to make sure that. They just need time to get it done. But what's happening? No, they're just shutting it down. Now, if I was a consumer in Ontario and Quebec, I'd be very concerned when I start listening to my members of parliament. Lucky we're going into summer. Lucky I don't need heat for my house. Lucky. You know, if I was a farmer going into harvest and it's a damp harvest, lucky I don't need propane to dry my corn. Very lucky. But if this does get shut down, those questions aren't going away. And there has been no plan B put in place to deal with it. You know, it's really disappointing when we start hearing the left talk about how it's worried about our own sovereignty. Here's a situation where Canada's sovereignty is being dictated in a U.S. court. Really? Why wouldn't you actually take on 25,000 jobs in Sarnia being decided outside of Canada? But that is what's happening right now. And when you go to the committee and when you start going to other members of other parties and say, okay, you know what, this isn't that smart. And my member who spoke before me, she, she talked about this. Maybe we should have our own pipeline. Maybe we should make sure we have our capacity so that we can actually take care of ourselves, especially learning from the lessons we've learned from COVID-19. You know, I find it really, nobody talks about the 25 to 30,000 people. These are people 
on May 13th, if this was to be shut down, may or may not have a job. They may or may not be able to pay their mortgage. They may or may not be able to buy groceries. Is there a game plan put in place for unemployment offices? Is there a game plan put in place to uh, transition them into new jobs? And then if you look at it, okay, well, what about the auto sector? What about the other manufacturing sector? Everybody thinks this is oil and gas. Well, what about the plastics and the other components that come out of those refineries that go into Ontario manufacturing that get shipped around the world? You know, in the auto sector right now, they're having issues with computer chips. Well, what would happen now if all of a sudden they couldn't get the plastics they need for their bumpers or other items in their cars? And then how sustainable is that auto sector in Canada if we can't even supply the components that go into the cars? Or does it just move to the U.S. with everything else and then the left just says, oh, I guess that's what happens when we shut everything down. Mr. Speaker, it's very, very frustrating when I look at the line five. We had the special committee and I thought everybody was on the same page and understood the importance of it. And then when I start hearing different comments from people in government or your ambassador and it sounds different. And when I see the member from Kingston get up here and not even talk about it and show such contempt for the 25,000 jobs, not understanding that two days from now, these folks could possibly be unemployed. And he wants to worry about an election. Liberals want to talk about an election. You know what, I'm worried about the jobs. I'm worried about those people. I'm worried about our economy. I'm worried about Canada having a future for our kids to grow up in. You know what, when we had an NDP government in Saskatchewan, at least you could go to Alberta and work. But when you have an NDP slash liberal government federally, where do our kids go to work? Mr. Speaker, I'll end it there. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Well, since the member uh, referenced me a couple times in his speech, and I appreciate that, I figure I owe him a, a question, Mr. Speaker. He did say uh, that I would probably be asking him a question about proposals, so then he proceeded to talk about a proposal in his mind, but it wasn't. What he did was he continued to talk about what might have to happen otherwise if the line is actually shut down. So. A proposal is to tell this House what the government should be doing differently in order to secure this piece of infrastructure so that it continues. So the question is very simple. What more would he do to actually encourage the governor to reverse her position so that we, 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 this infrastructure keeps, keeps uh, uh, being utilized? Member for Prince Albert. Thank you for that question. What should this government do? First of all, get your talking points straight. The ambassador should be saying the exact same thing as the minister, as the prime minister. If they're not, there's a order. Have a point of order, the honourable member for Kingston and the Islands. Most members know that they're not uh, that I don't use talking points. I would think, but he he should not be saying get he. Here's the point of order. He said you should not be using your talking points, and I'm certainly not using your talking points, Mr. Speaker, so. Thank the Honourable Member. Uh, yes, the Honourable Member for Prince Albert, uh, of course, you know, I, I noted that he, he does use the, the odd you and your reference in his speech. It was, I think, done in a rhetorical way. Um, but perhaps he was a little more direct that time, but uh, I think the Honourable Member is aware of that, so we'll let him carry on. And I, I do think that uh, we'll let him finish up his remarks, and then I think that's all the time we'll have. The Honourable Member for Prince Albert. And of course, Mr. Speaker, through you, this Liberal government should at least make sure that their diplomacy is in such a consistent manner that everybody is talking the same language, selling the same issues, discussing it, and making sure they have a game plan on the ground like we did with USMCA, where you're actually addressing it to the appropriate key people, the decision makers. But when the governor won't even talk to you, it kind of tells you how ineffective this Prime Minister is. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay.